presentation of HBO Sports. Every kid at one point or another gets asked the same question. What do you want to be when you grow up? At a young age, most people figure the answers don't really mean much of anything, particularly when they suggest the near impossible. But the danger there lies in what's being forgotten. If no one believed in the impossible, there would be nothing left to dream about. In a proud but struggling American city, they hear a lot about what they don't have anymore. They prefer to focus on what's still going strong. A team that's been a model of success for decades, in a sport that's entrenched here, not just in name, but in culture. They love hockey in Detroit, though across the border, there's an entire country that treasures the game as its national pastime. And in that country's largest city, for generations, the home team has been at once adored and agonized over. Nearly half a century has passed since the Stanley Cup was last raised in Toronto. But disappointments seem only to fortify their fan base and their faith in what is to come. In both these places, the game has been part of the fabric since hockey's earliest days binding the franchises together in history, building traditions around casts of legends. The uncommon passion sharply invigorates the latest set of stars. The exceptional promise deeply resonates with those just on their way. These days, as much as ever before, they want to be hockey players when they grow up. Because it's hockey that makes them believe in what just might be possible. This is 24-7. since it declared bankruptcy, Detroit, Michigan has been the subject of too many obituaries to count. But while the bleakness may be unavoidable, there are also reminders that it will take much more for the city's soul to submit. One piece of evidence will be in action all winter long, and they hope well into the spring. Hi again, everybody. It's Saturday night in Hockey Town, the Joe Lewis Arena in downtown Detroit. Tonight, the 118th consecutive sellout as the Detroit Red Wings face off against the Florida Panthers. It's nice to play in a city where they care about hockey. It matters you if you lose, and you know they're happy if you win. I, I think as a professional athlete, you need pressure to uh, to play well. This building alone just breathes hockey. This is been a winning organization for years and years and that's just what is expected and you bring it every night and that's how it works here. Putting on the jersey is it's got a lot of history. You want to wear it proudly and you want to work hard on it. 
Until you've coached or played on an original six team, you don't understand the tradition. You're supposed to have success each and every year, and, and I think that's a great thing. The Red Wings have qualified for the playoffs each of the last 22 seasons. So far, the current campaign has been a streaky one and of late, hindered by injuries to their two star forwards, team captain Henrik Zetterberg and Pavel Datsuk. Shouldering the load in their absence have been a blend of longtime club presences and new acquisitions. All told, entering game 31 against the Florida Panthers, coach Mike Babcock's club sits in third place in the Atlantic Division. It's up, fellas. Let's have a look. They split off every face-off. Let's make sure we have a plan. Also, the wingers tonight. We need the puck. Let's make sure we're diving in to help. Get your ass out. Go east-west. Any time in their zone is going to lead to some confusion. And the guy on the wall gets the puck. He needs the push-the-pace guy. He needs someone underneath it talking to him. Let's execute. Let's play fast. Tots! Yep. Let's get her dialed in here, kid. Oh, yeah. In out, in out. Starting line out. <laughs> Starting at the right wing, the guy who came into the saloon and asked for Tatar haircut, Daniel Alfredson. <laughs> Tonight is winger Thomas Tatar's turn up in Babcock's latest experiment at keeping his team loose, having a player announce the starting lineup with any embellishments he might desire. In the def on the defense, the oldest guy in the decor, he's 32, but act like he's 60. Number two, oh sorry, number 55, Nicholas Cromwell. Number recently named the best looking athlete in the US by GQ magazine, number 52, Jon Eriksson. In a goal, starting who was found in Scotland Lakes, Jonas Loch Ness Monster, Gustafsson. It was years ago in Sweden but a coach first called six foot three inch goalie Jonas Gustafsson the monster. Tonight, the backup is keeping regular starter Jimmy Howard on the bench for the second straight game. With Babcock electing to stay with the hot hand. Monster, go! So far this year, Gustafsson started nine games and won eight of them. If the Red Wings season has had a few quirks, one is their mediocre play at Joe Lewis Arena where they're normally done. The struggling Panthers would seem to be a ripe target to improve against. Let's jam at the net here. Let's make plays. I got it, I got it! Can't sit in front, rebound, Cleary scores! Daniel Cleary's opening goal is just the second of his ninth season in Detroit. Good job, boys. Gotta pass it off. And well done, man. Well done. This summer, the left winger had an offer for a multi-year contract elsewhere, but we signed to stay here in Hockey Town. I've been here a long time and, you know, obviously got a good relationship with Babs and, you know, we talked uh, a lot over the summer and we just tried to wait as patiently as we could and I was going to go to Philadelphia and I just, uh, my heart just wouldn't let me leave. As the second period begins with the score still 1-0, Jimmy Howard reclaims his position at the end of the Detroit bench, clipboard in hand. A season ago, Howard's brilliance and goal propelled the team to the playoffs and earned him a nearly $32 million contract extension. But this year, he struggled to maintain that form. You want to ride your starter. He wants to play every night, especially when he's playing well. But the reality is we need to have strong goaltending to have success in this league. And how he's one of those guys who can carry a huge workload and likes to play. But as long as Gus continues to play well, he should play. Don't lose! Don't lose! Don't lose! This game can be very cruel and also very good to you at times, so it's just important that you try and find that consistency of, uh, you know, playing the same way every single night. Get through the middle hard here, come on! And three minutes into the period, Jonas Gustafsson has dealt his own reminder of the perils of the crease. Saved there by Gus and fought off the score! The rebound! Wait a minute. Banged in by Jimmy Hayes! Well, I heard a whistle go. Come on, boys, we got way more! There's no more scoring in the period, and they'll head to the second intermission tied, with Babcock irritated not at his goalie's laps, but his team's lack of purpose. Hey, hold up, stop doing what you're doing for a second. Stop. So, well, Gus did a real good job for us, set us up in a great position. And right now, though, that period, we let ourselves off the hook. We think we're tired. Forget that stuff, it's right here. 
Let's make the commitment to one another. Let's dig in. Let's win some battles. We're way better than that. Let's dial her up. Let's go get this done. Come on here. Let's go. Up, up, up. Go time. The Red Wings earned some chances in the third period. Like so often at home this season, they remain nothing more than that. Instead, it's the Panthers who capitalize on what comes their way. Pass to Gilbert, not in front. Here's a backhand, and they score. Huberto right out in front of the goal. And the Panthers take a 2-1 to -one lead over Detroit. If you want, you can talk about our record at home and all that. That, to me, is totally different than tonight. We didn't have energy. We played last night. They had energy. We knew the game was going to be 2-1. We were just hoping that the game was going to be 2-1 for us. Uh, the bottom line is we didn't have enough to get it done tonight. See you guys. Thank you. There's another game against these same opponents three nights away in Florida. A walk down the hallway offers a first chance to figure out how to improve the ending. On game days in Toronto, the choices for Maple Leafs captain Dion Phaneuf mount long before the opening faceoff. And when the right ensemble is selected, no detail is too small to be attended to. Once ready for presentation, on his way out the door, he grants a first look to the pair of ladies in his life. Six-month-old Pearl. Say hello. And his wife of five months, actress Alicia Cuthbert. The thing is, if you have to wear a suit to work, why not have fun with it, right? And he definitely has a good time with it. See ya. Love you. Yeah. See you, Pearl. Phaneuf is a native of Edmonton, Alberta. And it was there that his father, Paul, a construction worker, built the foundation for his life on the ice. He was always a dream of mine to be a hockey player. I know that. Very lucky to have a backyard rink since I was two years old. My dad put a rink in for me. And, uh, night in and night out, I was, I was out there till my parents brought me in. It was just so special. You, you had this dream to be an NHL player. And, and then when it becomes a reality, it's, it's an experience like, like no other. They call Toronto the, the center of the hockey universe for a reason. To be a Toronto Maple Leaf in, in the city of Toronto, it's, uh, it's a huge honor to represent this city and, and to wear the jersey night in and night out. Nearly 10 weeks into the season, Phaneuf and the Leafs sit in fifth place in the Atlantic Division two points behind the Red Wings. Tonight's opponent, meanwhile, is another familiar foe, the Boston Bruins. Watch these guys, eh, fellas? Yeah. Come on, Kirk, you say, buddy? It's me? Yeah, baby. The closer it gets to game time, the quieter the locker room gets, until head coach Randy Carlisle enters for a few final words. All right, starters here. We're starting Smitty, Clarkie, Mason Raymond, Gunnar Dion, and Jonathan Bernier. For us, it's about creating our forecheck, all right? We've got to create our forecheck, put pucks in and go to work. Skate on these guys, all right? We want to be aggressive versus these guys. Force them to play defense, all right? Put the pucks down low and go to work. Stay disciplined, play our game. Let's go, boys. the season red hot and the strength of their goaltending and special teams. But thanks in part to a spate of injuries, the young club's play has been more up and down of late.
after that exchange of hockey pleasantries, the Leafs find the first opening. They'll head into the first intermission up one to nothing, a lead that means only so much this early. Of course, it will take a while before the Leafs are comfortable with a lead of any size, considering what happened this past May against these very same Bruins. It was the deciding game seven in the first round of the Stanley Cup playoffs. The Leafs were making their first postseason appearance in nine years against the more experienced and favored Bruins. It was the Leafs, though, who held a commanding 4-1 to lead midway through the final period, exhilarating their fans back home in Toronto. But then, it all fell apart. That was, uh, you know, not the way we envisioned it playing out. We had no idea what had just happened. We just blew a three-goal lead in, in 10 minutes. It was a bit surreal. Blowing a 4-1 lead in hockey is tough to do, let alone in game seven of the series. So you look back on that game 20 years from now, it's you'll still, like, it's, not, it can't happen, <laughs> um, but it did. My emotions were, I didn't know how I can describe them. I mean, there's just, you're just shocked, really. I mean, you didn't even have time to feel anything, really, is what it came down to. It's been difficult, believe me. And it, it was like a stake in our heart. We did make the playoffs, and we had captured the emotion of the city, and that was great. It was great for our players to experience that, but we failed. But what we tried to carry on into this season is that we weren't going to, you know, sit back and worry about what happened last year. We can't change that. It's over. It's gone. There's some new players, a new group of players. And this is a, a new life for our group, and we believe that we've got confidence from that playoff series. Tonight, though, that confidence quickly evaporates at the hand of their rival. Three goals propel Boston in front in the second period. And things don't get any better in the third. Then, with just two minutes left and the game all but decided, Dion Phaneuf comes in dangerously and imprudently on Boston's Kevin Miller. And Miller is in a lot of discomfort down in the corner. Dion, come on, buddy. Dangerous looking play here as Miller's in trouble. He goes right head first here from behind. Oh, right into the boards. Later on in the night, Phaneuf will be told there'll be a hearing with the NHL's Department of Player Safety to review the late hit. Hardly the kind of coda the captain envisioned back at the start of his day. Yeah, you help me, Phoenix. William, are you helping? Yes, yes. Okay, Carrie. Yes. Oh, good, good job. Perfect. Back in Detroit, Sunday is an off day. And in the suburban enclave of Birmingham, a new family in town uses some free time to do some holiday decorating. As strange as it might sound to many in hockey, Daniel Alfredson is now a Detroit Red Wing after a storied 17-year career with the Ottawa Senators. 
I didn't have the intention to leave. I, I thought I was going to stay. And then uh, talking to uh, Kenny Holland and Babcock about what they thought I could bring to their team kind of got me really thinking. And uh, you know, maybe at this stage in my career, try something new and and also uh, uh, challenge myself uh, both on and off the ice. After so much time with one team, Alfredson has had some adapting to do. Though the more difficult adjustments have fallen on his wife, Bibi, and their four sons. It's easy for me to fit in uh, uh, coming to a new team. I think that's the easiest part. The toughest part is more for the family off the ice. You know, you change to a new team, you have 20 new friends instantly, and uh, off the ice is not the same way. I think we were all so super excited when we first got here, and then uh, we realized that uh, this is it. We're staying here, and this is what we're doing. And then they started missing their friends and the regular life that they had. So it's been a little bit challenging, uh, but overall, I think it's been good. James, you want full gear or just skates and uh, sweatpants? Full gear. Is this your stick? The white one? If life in Detroit will take some getting used to, there are benefits to being the sons of a Red Wing star. And later in the afternoon, Dad takes his three oldest boys, Hugo, Louie, and Phoenix, over to the office. Joe Louis Arena is closed to the public today, but exceptions are made for certain VIPs. No fights. And on the building's hallowed ice, lessons of the family trade are passed on. Hey. What are you guys doing? <laughs> okay, put sticks down. And... We're picking your nose. <laughs> 24 hours later, Alfredson returns to the same ice alongside his 20 newest friends for practice. That was fast. Rump, hold. Move it, move it. His last 13 seasons in Ottawa were spent as team Quick. captain. His leadership responsibilities here aren't as formal. It's, it's been uh, mixed emotions. I, I've missed... Uh, uh, I miss being the guy sometimes, but at the same time, it's been uh, a lot of fun to be part of this locker room. They expect to win, and uh, it rubs off on people that, uh, that come in from the outside. You know, they have a great core group here that's been around a long time, that are leading the team, and I think I can add to that a little bit with my experience. With Captain Henrik Zetterberg sidelined indefinitely with a back injury, other veterans stepping into the void include wingers Johan Franzen and Todd Bertuzzi, as well as defensive anchor Nicholas Kronwall. Another prominent figure for Detroit is this man, center Pavel Dutzik. After missing seven games following a concussion, the wing's leading goal scorer and most dynamic player is on the cusp of a return, a development his teammates are eagerly awaiting. He truly is a magician out there with the puck. He works on those things every single day in practice, so when eventually when he does bring it out in a game, it's, it's no surprise to me. The anticipation and the balance he has on his skates, it's, uh, it's pretty neat to watch. Well, elite, elite, elite. I think the best two-way player in the world, bar none. Unbelievable work ethic and a great leader, quiet leader, whose drive for excellence and success is fantastic. When you look at a game, you rely on, on certain players to, to step up every game, and he's one of those guys that does that for us. So uh, we missed him, and we're, we're looking forward to having him back. In Toronto, the Leafs' practice is canceled on Monday following the loss to the Bruins. One player does have work to get done. Winger Joffrey Lupel is one of several Leafs who battled injuries in the early part of the season. Lupel went down with a grade two groin strain in late November. You gotta be mentally strong. I mean, it can be pretty frustrating not traveling with the team and, and not playing. Uh, 
Um, first time I've had a, any type of muscle injury like this before, so it's it's frustrating. You go from feeling pretty good one day and then you get out on the ice and it doesn't quite feel as good as you thought it was. You, you wish you never got hurt, but I think for the most part I do a, a good job of uh, working hard off the ice and, and trying to come back 100%. I think initially I thought I was going to make a, a pretty quick recovery just based on how it was the first couple of days and and uh, now I'm pretty much at two weeks right where we thought we'd be and, and uh, hoping I'll be able to play Wednesday. Adversity is nothing new for the 30-year-old Lupul. He struggled with injuries over his decade in the league and bounced around with four different teams. But since coming to the Leafs in 2011, when healthy, Lupul has thrived as an offensive force and developed into a team leader. Minus the injury, he couldn't be happier to be here. I've had a chance to play in other places that have that tradition. A place like Philadelphia is a uh, great sports town, great fans, and, and uh, the organization has that real sense of history and, and tradition, but coming here is something completely different. Like a New York Yankee, a Dallas Cowboy, a Toronto Maple Leaf, so it's, uh, it's cool, it's special. Being a Maple Leaf also presents an opportunity to be part of the group that ends the longest Stanley Cup drought in the NHL, 46 years. I would like to be one of the people who bring the, the Stanley Cup back to Toronto. That, that almost goes without saying. As far as the 46 years goes, I mean, it really doesn't have anything to do with me or any of the current players here or even current staff here. So, yes, you feel bad for, for fans uh, in Toronto, but all we can control is, is what we control on a day-to-day -day basis, how hard we work, how much we improve, and, and whether or not we win the Stanley Cup in, in our time here. So. It seems like a kind of a daunting task when someone says, you haven't won the Stanley Cup in 46 years. Well, I haven't won it in, in the three years since I've been here. That's all I can, that's all I can apologize for. <sighs> Unless something comes up, I'd say I'm ready to go. But again, that's a discussion I gotta have with the trainers and then ultimately they have it with the coach. So we'll see, but. I feel good. I mean, I've made a steady improvement every day, so I think that's what you're <clears throat> what you're after in these these muscle pull type injuries. So we'll see. While the Leafs have no practice today, there is a different sort of ice gathering in the afternoon. Across town at the Rico Coliseum, the club and its minor league affiliate, the Marlies are holding a joint Christmas party for players and their families. Among the first Leaf arrivals are 29-year-old Toronto native David Clarkson, his wife Brittany, and their two-year-old daughter McKinley. Clarkson played his first seven NHL seasons with the New Jersey Devils, but made big news here this summer when as a free agent, he decided to come home. I think uh, being from here and, and being lucky enough to wear that jersey that I, I wore as a young boy is, uh, is special. I think being in the U.S. as long as I was, I really loved it there and enjoyed it, but anytime you get to go home and, and you, you hear your, your anthem, you know, every time that, oh Canada, you know, that's something special that you feel inside. Are you ready? Well, that's uh, my daughter there, McKinley, and uh, She's a, a little princess. She runs around the house dressed up and uh, wears her outfits, but uh, it's fun. It brings a smile to your face and, and really takes you away from whatever bad day you had or whatever you had going on. The party also includes food and drink in an adjoining room. 
a more popular gathering spot for the unmarried team members who compose the majority of the Leafs roster, including the team's current first line, star winger Phil Kessel. You only get so many chances in this game. James Van Riemsdyk and Nazem Kadri, a trio amply entertained by the off-ice diversions. Oh! Yes! Yes! That is unheard of. Meanwhile, for team captain Dion Phaneuf, a hearing on his late hit has been confirmed for 10 a.m. tomorrow morning. But he's not going to let that spoil some time at the rink with his wife. I'm just here to enjoy the holiday uh, holiday party. So uh, tomorrow is tomorrow, and we'll deal with that tomorrow. But obviously, I'm here to, to enjoy the, the evening and have some fun, skate with my wife, and enjoy the day. We're real fortunate that the people on the top of our team, they bring it every single day. Their off-ice training is meticulous. Uh, their on-ice habits, unbelievable. Their will to have success is fantastic. That is very beneficial to any coach in any organization, and that's part of the culture that we try to pass on here. After Red Wings practices, Mike Babcock spends a half hour circling the concourse at Joe Louis Arena. In his eight plus seasons in Detroit, he's won more games than any other coach in the National Hockey League. In these runs, he ponders ways to win more. He demands a lot out of his players and he's got a lot of loyalty to guys that work hard, do things the right way. There are going to be times during the year when things don't go the right way, but I think he's been very good at keeping everyone grounded, uh, making sure that everyone stays positive and stick with and keep believing in what we do. What worked last year isn't going to work this year. you got to keep evolving and getting better, and that's the same for players and coaches and management, is we have to find a way to continue to get better each and every day so that we can be in the playoffs and have a run. Babcock has also led teams to gold medals at the World Championships and Olympic Games. But Detroit has been his chief laboratory of leadership. And maintaining the Red Wings' tradition of excellence is central source of pride. We haven't won a cup here since 08. And so to me, what have you done for us lately? So as a coach, getting on top is one thing, staying on top is another thing, no different than our franchise. So we are. The flight from frigid Detroit to sunny Florida will be a little less than three hours. A quiet chance to clear the mind will be welcomed by all who climb aboard. Maybe we're still in silence, but maybe we feel the guidance. Maybe your own devices will keep you afraid and cold. But I They touch down in Fort Lauderdale at dusk, getting a brief dose of the comfortable weather before heading off down the highway. So far this season, the road has proved to be an ally. The team has one of the best records away from home in the league. It's a trend that, like so many other things in their game, is ultimately unexplainable. But their focus is solely and simply on continuing it. Are you guys hungry? I bet you they have a mean fish and chips here. An hour after check-in, several Red Wings reconvene at a restaurant a few miles from the hotel. Justin Abdelkader, Kyle Quincy, Darren Helm, Brendan Smith, and Danny DeKaiser compose an unofficial dinner club on trips like this. Even if tonight, the house specials aren't enticing everyone. Do you guys have any questions for the menu? How are the ribs here? <laughs> No way you're ordering ribs. Uh, you're a beast. Yeah. <laughs> the waves of food come quickly and abundantly. And ultimately, the conversation shifts to the potential return of Pavel Dotsuk. No, but like seriously, is Pavel playing tomorrow? I'm going to say yes. I, I think so. Yeah, he's so special. It's, 
don't know, I personally think he's top two, one in the world. They're so focused on what he's gonna do and where he is that you know it just opens up everything for him. I'll be honest, if I have the puck in the defensive zone, I look for 13, yeah. nonstop. Maybe sit Kendall twice and pass it to 13. Drop back. <laughs> yes. we... Hey, how did you get stitches? Uh, same play as my shoulder. I went down and uh, I don't know who's, who it was, tried to like jump over me, clip me in the ear. Skate? Yeah, and my ear came off. <laughs> Hey guys, the guy at the end of the bar would like to buy you guys a shot of closing Clairvaux. Tell them instead of a shot, we'll do a fish taco with them. Oh, those go. look great. <laughs> Whoa, what did you get? Some chicken curry. What is this? <laughs> oh my god. It's been a little more than a year and a half since Randy Carlyle was named head coach of the Toronto Maple Leafs. The hiring was something of a homecoming for Carlyle, who as a player was a second round draft pick of the team in 1976. He'd eventually win a Norris Trophy as the league's top defenseman with the Pittsburgh Penguins and finish an 18 year career in Winnipeg with the Jets. As a coach, he led the Anaheim Ducks to a Stanley Cup in 2007 has come here with the same objective, as well as hockey beliefs that are simple and timeless. I think my coaching style is based upon firm but fair. I believe that there has to be structure created. I think it's a coach's uh, responsibility to uh, make sure that his team is uh, disciplined in the areas that aid to the rules that are, that are out there in, in the game and uh, to the team concepts. And, if you're not prepared to hold them accountable to that, then uh, then you're lacking in your responsibility. He's completely honest, sometimes brutally honest, some stuff you don't really want to hear, but it is good that you hear it. He's a bit hard on you sometimes, but uh, everyone needs a good you know, kick in the butt every once in a while, especially myself, so. Before he got here, wins definitely did come seldomly, so I mean, it was a good change for the organization, I think, and. You know, he really brought some hope and faith into this uh, organization and the team that um, not only could we win, but we could be one of the best teams in the league. This morning in the team lounge, the coach's mood is bright. Breakfast, huh? Where are you at? I'm almost done. This toaster is better, huh? They're actually toast. Yeah. And this warm. They force you into healthy stuff, the almond, no more peanut butter, it's almond butter. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The spreads aren't the only things to vex him. I got a toast stuck in the toaster. <laughs> Look at that. It is. It is stuck in the toaster. Maintenance! <laughs> Bobby! You guys did this on purpose. <laughs> Unplugged it. Zip! <laughs> there you go. It's our best man on it. <laughs> the chipper disposition might be a bit surprising, considering later this morning, Carlisle could well be losing his captain to a suspension. We're not being too optimistic, to tell you the truth. So we'll deal with it as we do with the injuries. And the other ones that we've had, we've had our fair share of uh, alterations to our lineup due to injury and suspension this year. So Just a few more headaches for the coach. Upstairs, Leafs general manager Dave Nonis and vice president of hockey operations Dave Poulin are preparing for this morning's phone hearing with the league's Department of Player Safety. A hearing that will decide the short-term fate of Dion Phaneuf. We're down by two goals. Dion's trying to retrieve the puck. It's not one where he's, he's trying to go after a player. Yeah, it's a split-second decision by Dion, and the player actually goes off balance just before Dion gets there. So there's a shot where you can see a split second before Dion, and, it's easy to say stop at that point. You're going into a situation to retrieve a puck, and all of a sudden, 
the last second the player turns slightly because he's propelled in, the player is propelled in because of another action. You never know what's, you know, you don't know what's going to happen. You know, everyone's opinion of what happens is always different, but it's, it's a fair process and present the case as best we can. Um, we feel there, there, you know, there are mitigating factors to the, the play and then we'll, we'll see what the league, how they feel about it. You know, it's interesting in a jury trial that one of the first questions to a jury is how much do you know about the case? And in this situation, it's just the opposite. It's everybody knows everything about the case. So everyone has made their own decisions. You listen to the pontificators on the way in. Everyone's decided what it's going to be, you know, in their minds. We don't do that. We don't speculate. We don't prejudge. We don't, you know, it, I think the system's in place. And the unique thing is the system represents both sides of the parties. I mean, that's unique. The system is literally representing, the PA is representing both players. The NHL is representing both players. So it is a fair process. A few minutes before 10, FNAF is escorted upstairs to join Nonis and Poulin for the closed door conference call. The team's practice is held later on in the morning. By the time the coach skates on, he's been apprised of the league's decision. News he shares with Fanuf at center ice. I got two games. So, how do you think I feel? Not very good, but that's the way it is. At the start of every season, every NHL player has certain dates he circles on the calendar. Tonight's matchup in Florida is one such occasion for a man who played 11 seasons for the Panthers before leaving this summer, Red Wing center Stephen Weiss. I'm going to want to do well, I'm going to want to win the hockey game, obviously, in front of people that I played for uh, a long time. But, uh, you know, I'm sure there will be some mixed emotions. I have a lot of good friends there and uh, a lot of buddies that I played with over the last few years. Inside the visitors' locker room, though, Weiss's return is far from the only notable narrative. After a seven-game absence, Pavel Dotsuk is, as hoped, back in the starting lineup. As is goalie Jimmy Howard, returning to the net after sitting out three of the last four contests. Never been one, you know, that's been, been a fan of sitting there, but, uh, you know, I understand and uh, why, you know, Coach decided to do that. Gus has been playing awesome and, uh, you know, he deserved to play. Oh, Howie's a good guy. Game day, you don't even talk to him. You know, the goalie quirks. He's always uh, doing his uh, moves in the mirror, you know. Let's go! The Wings get off to a fast start, earning a power play in the game's opening minute, and appearing, at least for a moment, to take the game's first lead. player 71 in the crease. So what's the call there? An incidental contact on the goalie. So that's a goal. If he's inside, if he's inside. But I just know in the league we're trying to get more goals, not less. Ladies and gentlemen, a warm welcome back to Stephen Wise. In the next break in the action, the Panthers honor the man who played more games for them than anyone else in history. And Weiss can't help but peek at the tribute. Watching my highlights. Watching my highlights. I think any time you're with a team for that long, it's tough to leave. They didn't offer me a contract, so I was free to, to do what I wanted and, and to come to a place like Detroit, a team I grew up watching, had a lot of respect for, is pretty awesome. With the evening ceremonial components complete, a few minutes later, the Red Wings get another opportunity up close. Score! Good job, man, good job. How to get open. 
Captain Mule, good job! As Babcock looks for more of the same in a second, Weiss finds himself sent to a place in this arena he's never been, the visitor's penalty box. Hey, are you kidding me? It's our penalty, number 90, two minutes, okay. But on the subsequent power play, the Panthers fail to score. And then when the Wings get a man advantage, Pavel Datsuk converts. Fires it to the side of the goal, and Datsuk scores! Fabiel! Let's come back, Fabiel! Nice play, Back in the locker room, the team's two injured centers, Henrik Zetterberg and Darren Helm, like what they're seeing. But in front of a hostile crowd, the Wings head inside, knowing how many things can happen with a period to play. Babcock implores them to maintain the pressure. Hey, fellas, uh, the big thing here is we want to play in the offensive zone. Their net front D is going to be jumping all the time, but not if we're playing in their zone, grinding. So let's shoot the puck, let's drive the middle, let's play heavy, keep our shift short, stay connected, but let's attitude. Foot on the gas, let's go get the next one. Come on here, boys, let's go. Big start. But if the third period will prove to be problematic for facility managers, things don't go much better for the visitors. Five minutes in, the Panthers finally find a way into the net to get on the board. It's back in the line to Kulikov with a shot redirected in front of the score. That counter, let's go, let's go. And suddenly, the pressure on Jimmy Howard is increased substantially. When I first arrived here, our goaltending didn't have to be as good as it is now. We used to get way more run support, and, and now three is a big night for us. So we need good goaltending. Now makes a power move to the front of the goal, and he scores! Hey, let's go, let's go here! Let's go get the next one! We need a win here! But the rest of regulation and overtime go by without another goal scored setting the stage for a shootout, an element of the game where the Wings have struggled of late. Here's Boyd moving right down in front. He shoots and scores off the inside of the left goal post, beating Jimmy Howard. Dating back to last season, it's Detroit's 10th straight shootout loss. After a short late night flight across the state, the team reconvenes at the Tampa Bay Times Forum for practice the next morning in advance of their game Thursday night against the Lightning. For me personally, it's, uh, you know, I've learned how to take the, the schedule in stride. I think uh, when I was younger and uh, when I was first trying to come into the NHL, um, you know, it was a little bit of a roller coaster. You try to uh, take on that same outlook and, you know, that's coming to, you know, work every single day and working hard. When you have guys that have won before, they know when not to panic. It's early in the season, we're in, we're in a good spot in the standings, and, uh, and you gotta just keep moving forward and, and, and believe that uh, it's gonna turn around, it's gonna take a bounce. But just as practice is winding down, a new concern arises, as Howard exits the ice with an apparent injury. I was moving to my right, <clears throat> went to make a save, and all my weight on my, went on my left knee and just uh, felt and heard a pop. We're going to uh, take him back to Detroit with us, and we'll get some uh, imaging and uh, have him see our doc and uh, keep him out tomorrow, but hopefully it won't be long term. He says he's learned to take the turns of a season in stride. But suddenly, what's behind the next door is nothing but uncertainty. Wednesday is another game night in Toronto, and in the pregame calm of an empty locker room, the number 19 sweater takes its rightful place at the end of its row. Joffrey Lupel has been given the go-ahead to play against the Los Angeles Kings. Always push to the left, or yeah. just if it's... Ideally, unless you're on a loop and you're on the guy quick, and you can you're go on. this way, but ideally want to push to our left side. The left winger's return to the lineup is coming none too soon his team facing a Kings club on a four-game winning streak. 
forced to do it without Captain Dion Phaneuf, was beginning his two-game suspension. Right at the outset, the crowd favorite wastes little time making an impact. But when a Peter Holland holding penalty interrupts the Leafs' energetic start, the opportunistic Kings quickly take advantage on the power play. Oh, no. and LA takes a one nothing lead. Jones save, rebound, loose hit from France into a second back and left, rebound, oh, it was hit by Jones, and another one. High above the Air Canada center ice, Fanoff is reduced to watching with the rest of the 19,000 spectators. And in comes Phil Kessel, a long shoot, stop by Jones. Fully middle, snap, snap. The breakthrough finally comes late in the second period on a five-on-three power play for the Leafs. Kessel winds his way to the top. In comes Kessel. Drops it back. Shot score. The tying goal is Cody Franson's first of the year and enlivens the crowd. And then Joffrey Lupo steps into the spotlight again. The four-minute penalty means Lupul will spend the remainder of the period watching the game from the locker room. When his teammates join him, the game is still tied. And Randy Carlisle's instructions are straightforward. Middle lane drive, rebounds. How many rebounds are coming off this guy? Big chest, lots of rebounds, lots of junk out there. Right? Feed the chickens here. Shots from these areas here. Class will come back off the pads. Drive that middle lane. It's simple. We're not asking to be a complicated team here. We've got 20 minutes for a big win. Let's go. Come middle, come middle, come middle. Oh. As the final period begins, the Leafs heed their coach's words and keep the pressure on the Kings rookie goalie, Martin Jones. But midway through, the Leafs get caught up ice. On the way! And the Kings' Jeff Carter makes them pay. Jeff Carter fires it home, and the Kings lead 2-1. to one. The Lupo winds his way in. In comes Lupo, shoots off on a pass saved by Jones. The goal is a painful blow. But the Leafs continue to press forward, doing everything they're supposed to, except score. The final tally is 3-1 Los Angeles. Even if there are encouraging signs to be found for the home team. We made some mistakes. There's mistakes in the game. You can't say that we didn't give ourselves the best chance. And you have to use it as a building block. And I know it's tough. It sucks. That's what sports is. We have to copy and use this as a starting point for this hockey club to demonstrate that type of work ethic on both sides of the puck. Get our heads up, get ourselves fed here, and get on a plane. <laughs> I was supposed to do great things. I know the room was long. But I wasn't raised to shoot for fame. I had the safety on. In a season that lasts so many months and is composed of so many games, 
there are facts of life that can be hard to appreciate. None perhaps more counterintuitive than the reality that losing is one of the most important things a team can do. Painful as defeat can be, there's no more powerful way to reinforce togetherness. Frustrating as it may seem, there's no more valuable method for recalibrating tactics. And while, of course, the pinnacle of the sport is ultimately reached through victory, it's everything else that reminds them how truly difficult it is to get there. to their outdoor clash and well beyond, adversity will continue to shadow them. Simply playing through it might well be the most important thing these teams can do. Part two of 24-7 Red Wings Maple Leafs Road to the NHL Winter Classic premieres on Saturday, December 21st at 10 p.m. Eastern and Pacific. December 17th, tune in for the Real Sports Year in Review. Join Bryant Gumbel and the correspondents for a look back at their favorite and most intriguing stories of 2013. January 18th, it's an all-Canadian light heavyweight matchup as Jean Pascal and Lucien Boutet meet at the Bell Centre in Montreal. This has been a presentation of HBO Sports.